Why so quiet? Anybody have anything exciting to share? I I I looked at a video this morning on the internet. I don't know. I was scrolling through the whatever, and there was this video that there was this video that popped up of a looked like a little kid, maybe two or three years old, sitting in his car seat, and he had a cup of food, and he was feeding the whatever animal with the long neck kept sticking his neck in the window and going into his cup. And this kid was crying, laughing. So that's why I stopped off my day. It was pretty funny. Just trying to get you guys just, you guys should be all smiles. All right, we'll get going and we'll wait for Zoe. She can join when she gets here. So welcome to week four. As I stated a few minutes ago, um, first and foremost, congratulations on the exam scores. Everybody in this class had a 78 or above. Everyone. Fantastic. Fantastic. So however you however you prepared, you did a fantastic job. I didn't have as much live review attendance as I would have liked. But um, I'm assuming you watch recordings. Is that right? Were those recordings helpful? There's a, mm. okay. Um, so, um, let's see, I watched the recordings. Review never matches my schedule. Yeah. Yep. 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 We try and spread them out the best we can trying to accommodate, you know, a weekend evening for people that work on the weekends. We do our best. Um, so I try, I try as a course lead, try and look at campus schedules and we try and spread out what we think is the best opportunity um, you know, morning one, a late afternoon and a weekend. So I realize that you can't, we may not be able to get to them. And I apologize for that. We do our best to try and spread it out. Um, but first and foremost, congratulations. Everybody was above a 78 in this class. So, or 78 or above in this class. Fantastic. So congratulations. Very, 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 very proud of you. Exam ones are always hard in any class especially this class, right? Because this class is not like your other classes, right? This is, uh, so well done, well done. Um, if anybody would like to meet with me to review the concepts that you may have struggled with, with exam one, please let me know. I already have a couple of students who have already reached out and we have some appointments scheduled. So if you would like to go over uh, the exam, um, we can do that. Okay. Um, the other thing is this week, week four, we always start our at risk meetings, they're called. Um, and I mention this because if your dean reaches out to you, um, you'll know what she's talking about. So starting in week four, we um, submit at risk reports to campuses. Okay. These are students for a variety of reasons. Students that are either below a 78 with their KGA, whether there's homework issues um, that are identified early, attendance issues identified early, quiz, low quiz scores. Okay. So I have submitted all faculty does in all your classes. We, we send reports to the Dean and we actually meet every two weeks. Um, every campus meets every two weeks. Um, and so it's great because we get on a Zoom with your campus, your campus leadership and talk about students and what we can do to help support students and what concerns we have. So I only say that because if, a, if your Dean reaches out to you and says, hey, I got an at-risk report from Professor Marvo, I see you haven't been turning your homework, or I see you have a couple of low quiz scores. What are you doing to <clears throat> correct that? I just don't want you to be surprised. Okay, they're not <clears throat> they're not meant to be punitive. 
at all. They're meant to just identify any potential red flags early on that we need to get corrected early on. Okay. So nobody's tattletailing, nobody's throwing you under the bus. These are, it's a requirement as faculty. And we look at a lot of different things. Okay. You may not hear from your Dean. You may hear from your Dean. Okay. So FYI about that. Um, so first things first, I would like to do the quiz. Okay. There's a, there's a, a general announcement in the quiz in the, in the general box that says you're going to take the quiz. It's 10 questions for this quiz. You need a calculator. Did everybody see that message? Okay. So take a minute and grab a calculator. So let's do that first. Can we use the one on the computer? Sure. Sure. Wherever you can get a calculator. Uh, uh, question 10 is a math question. But if you looked at your review, not but, if you looked at, um, yeah, I'll mention that in a minute. Anyway, you need to calculate, okay? So the code to get in is my last name, Marvel. I'm going to put that in the chat. Okay, so let's do the quiz. It's 15 minutes. Uh, it is 106, so you'll get started 120, 125. So you gotta stand cap, you gotta stand camera while you complete the quiz. Okay, and then after that, I wouldn't log off. Just stay logged on if you want to turn your camera off until we get back, get going again. We'll get going again at 125. And the one thing you'll see that's different in the quiz is um, rationales, okay? If you got the answer correct, there'll be a rationale. If you got the answer incorrect, there'll be a rationale. They're actually the same rationales um, for correct and incorrect. And that's what we're going to review in detail when we come back. All righty? So it should be available. Can you guys get into it? All right.
still have one student to finish, should be done shortly. And then if everybody could start coming back on camera, that'd be fantastic. How'd you do? Did you do all right? <clears throat> Remember, quizzes are all about class preparation, right? We covered weeks three and four this week. There's a lot to, well, last week we had an exam, but a lot to cover. Oh, a lot to cover. We had six chapters. 24, 25, 26 last week, and 4, 9, 30 this week. The other thing to remember about exam uh, quiz prep and coming to class prepared, <clears throat> I mentioned this, I think, in week two, when I went through the book with you guys and showed you how to really hone in on the book and the chapters, right? I'll be a little bit more specific about the book. If you can answer the objectives, right? Let's say you read the objectives before you start the chapter, they're right at the beginning, and then you really hone in on where to find the content of those objectives, right? If after re you review the chapter, and you can go back and answer those objectives, then you have adequately covered the chapter. Does that make sense? Because the objectives are really a snapshot of the content, right? In the chapters. So if you read them at the beginning, as you're reading through the chapter, highlight, where those, not answers, but where that content is that answers the objective. And then you go back and reread the objective, ob objectives. And if you can answer those questions after you reviewed the chapter, you're good. You should be good. Does that help? Okay. All right. Let's take a look at, um, Christina, if you could come back on camera, that'd be great. Okay. I'm going to Share my screen. Did you guys see the rationales? Did you like those? That is Professor Lundy, our course lead. She is just fantastic. And I... You know, having been the course lead in PN and teaching both art and PN, I really, really like that idea of putting the putting the um, rationales. And I didn't do it for quiz one because I, I really wasn't not aware. We talked about it and we talked about it freely after the quiz. But I think it's a fantastic idea to have these um, rationales in the quizzes. Now, just a question. If you got the, after you submitted question one, did the rationale come up or did they all come up at the end? They all come up, came up in the end. Uh, in the end. Okay, great. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. We're, so for the rest of the class, for the next hour, we're going to review the quiz and the rationales, right? And we're, then we're going to, I want to review a PowerPoint that, um, it's a week three, four critical thinking PowerPoint review, okay? And then after class, when I send you the recording, I'm going to send you that PowerPoint so you have that, 
Okay, it's an excellent PowerPoint that one of our other teammates did for weeks three, four review. I'll send that to you with the recording. Okay, um, and then I do want to do the case study at the end. That won't take long at all. Okay, so we had a lot of content: rural migrant health, poverty, homelessness, teen pregnancy, mental illness, alcohol, tobacco, other drugs. That was week three. Government, the law, policy administration, or policy activism, faith community nurse. And then we reviewed, the, or you reviewed with your chapters, the nurse in public health, home health, palliative care, and hospice. There's a lot of content to cover. Did you learn a lot as you prepared for weeks three and four? There's a lot to community nursing. And hopefully you're figuring that out really quickly, right? Um, it's just It's just a big umbrella with so much that uh, goes into community and public health nursing. So let's go ahead and, and go through the quiz. I pulled up the longer version of the quiz, kind of from my, from my. Um, this is the way I see it. So it's gonna look busy, but if you notice, if you got the answer correct or incorrect, the rationales were the same. So we'll go through that. Okay, so which of the following statements by the clients indicates a lack of understanding regarding an appropriate reason to sue for professional negligence? Before we answer that question, in many of our at-risk meetings this week that I've already had, um, ex a lot of exams have already been taken in a lot of classes. And some of the feedback that comes up is that the students did well on the quizzes. I'm not sure why they didn't do that great on the exams. And then the professors chime in and say, well, I reviewed the exam with the students and they just weren't picking up on important words, cues, phrases in the questions. Okay, so, um, so I can only see a few of you, but this is, an, this is really important. OK, I heard that over and over again in the last couple of days. When I review with the student, they didn't read the question correctly. Right. So um, I like to do my exam prep strategy teaching along with the quizzes because the quizzes are questions are a lot similar to the exams. So um, I don't know if it, I don't do you guys. There's two resources in ExamSoft. One is a highlighter. Have I already gone through this with you? Have I already gone through my little mantra for exam taking and question reading? Okay, so there's a highlighter and there's a cross out answers. So I know you guys did well on exam one, but I'm just gonna repeat this, okay? So I, I know, my suggestion is you always read a question twice, whether it's a quiz question, exam question. Start by highlighting the any important words, cues, phrases in a question, okay? Then go to the answers and use the underline and cross out whatever answers. This is your first go around. Then cross out whatever answers you know don't make sense, right? So then when you go back and reread the question, you're gonna have words highlighted phrases highlighted, and you may only be choosing from two answers. Okay, so so this is a, so question one, what would you be highlighting in this question? Is this a positive or negatively framed question? Negative. Why is it negative, Ayana? Lack, lack of understanding. Yeah, so you're looking for something wrong. This is a good example of you are looking for something that lacks understanding. So this is what we call a negatively framed question. So I would also highlight negligence. Okay. Yep. Okay. So correct answer is A. My daughter wasn't given a call light for the whole shift. No one checked on her. Okay, that 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 answer demonstrates a lack of understanding. Because if you look at the other three, they're all examples of true negligence, right? Amputated the wrong leg, received permanent nerve damage, developed bed sores, 
Let's look at the rationale here. Professional negligence or malpractice is defined as an act or a failure to act, actually, that leads to an injury. To recover money damages and malpractice action, you have to prove the four things. So the correct answer in A is not, it, 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 there's no injury. That's why it's an, in, that's why it's incorrect or it's the correct answer, but it's lack of understanding. Does that make sense? So in order to pr uh, prove negligence or malpractice, all these four must have to be present. You had the duty to the client or you, you had the duty, you were responsible for the client's care. The duty to act the way a reason of, so in any, so any nurse and you had the, any reasonable prudent nurse would act in a similar way, given the circumstances. Okay, Fairly, failure to act reasonably under the circumstances that led to the injuries. Okay, and then lastly, the injuries provide the basis for monetary claims from the nurse as compensation for the injury. So all these have to be proved. Okay. Question number two. Which of the following principles is central to the role of the parish nurse? What did you learn? Well, number one, what would you highlight? I would highlight parish nurse, right? Role? I would highlight central because it's, it's kind of asking what is the central? What is the most important? Think of other, what's the most important role? What's the central role? That's a pretty big word, right? What did you learn about parish nursing when you were reading chapter 29? What is the central role? What, it, what does the parish nurse bring to the care? The spiritual dimension. Right? This is a great example of a question that more than one answer could be correct. Right? This is another one of those teaching moments. D, I think, could be correct. C might be. That's in the ballpark, right? So this is a good example of a question that is not a select all that apply. So you only get to select one answer. But if you if you look and say, oh, I don't know, A looks to be correct, D could be correct, what, and it's not a select all that apply, what should you do? Go back and read the question. What did you miss? In this case, it would be central. What's the most important role of the parishioners? Make sense? So what do we know about the faith community nurse? The nurse in the faith community is a licensed RN. She needs to have good, he or she needs to have good interpersonal skills strong religious faith, strong sense of spirituality, and desire to call to serve the needs of the community. Okay? And then, um, with additional education and spiritual care for, for self, for individuals, for groups, they work in a con uh, congregational setting. So whatever the desired goals and objectives are for the congregation, it will look different in every parish. Okay. Maybe the maybe they want the parish nurse to do support groups for grieving families uh, if somebody has died. For maybe they want the parish nurse to do support groups for prenatal education for new expecting parents. Maybe they want the the faith nurse to do well visits for teen, new teen moms. Okay, so it's a it's whatever whatever the congregation's needs are. It may be a small rural community where they want them to do all of that. 
It may be a large, I actually have two friends that are faith uh, parish nurses. And, and one of them works in a, a congregation that's so big, there's three of them. And they all have different roles. Okay. But the central role of the community nurse is to bring the spiritual aspect to the care on top of all the other areas in the scope of practice. Questions about parish nursing. Question three, father confides in a parish nurse that his wife has been hurting the three-year-old. Uh, the nurse examines the daughter and finds evidence of physical abuse. In the parish nurse role, which of the following actions should be taken first? What would you highlight in this question? What action should the nurse take first? First. Yeah. First. Okay. Forget that this is a parish nurse. Forget it's just a nurse. What, what do you do first when you suspect any kind of neglect abuse? Report, report it. it. You've got to report it. It doesn't matter if this is a hospice nurse, a parish nurse, a, a floor nurse at the hospital, urgent care nurse. Right? First. I mean, yes, you could. You could contact the pastor for guidance in handling the situation, but that's not what you do first. If you are the person that's suspecting the abuse, you are the one that makes the report. You can't go to the pastor and say, oh, what should I do here? Here's what I suspect. You have got to make the report. All right, so as required by law, nurse advocates for individuals and groups. Nurse is also expected to identify and report cases of neglect, abuse, illegal behaviors um, to the appropriate sources, right? And we know we're all mandated reporters. Okay, questions about that? Okay, which is the following is the primary focus of hospice care? What would you highlight here? Primary. Primary. So we're looking at what is the most important primary? What's the biggest primary on hospice care? Well, what do we know about the difference between, okay, what, what's the difference between hospice and palliative care? You can look in your um, rationale here because it's in there. But remember, hospice care is at true end of life. The definition of hospice focuses on comfort for individuals and their families at the end of life and does not include a curative treatment. That's hospice, end of life care. Palliative is a subset. Okay, so when somebody's diagnosed and maybe they say you have six months to live or you have two years to live, palliative care means that you're optimizing, trying to optimize whatever whatever life is left, optimizing the quality, right? Maybe anticipating, preventing, and treat, uh, preventing and and helping uh, treating the suffering. So pain control, right? Palliative care is throughout the continuum until they move into hospice care. All right, so in palliative care, well, and hospice as well, but we're addressing physical, intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual needs, right? We're trying to give pa the patient some autonomy to make some decisions through this palliative process. Make sense? So what's the primary focus of hospice care? Let's go back to the question. Providing palliative care to mean comfort until death. Okay, B is incorrect because one of the things that we can't do in hospice care is cure, right? C doesn't even make sense. C would be a cross out. You could go line that out, right? Teaching the client and family how to care for themselves. Yes, that's part of it. 
but it's asking what the primary focus is. All right, so you could actually, if you were using the, the highlighter and the underliner, you could have crossed out B and C. Right, so you're left with two answers. <clears throat> Going back and reading the question, what's the primary focus? Obviously, it's A. Okay. Question five. Which of the following aspects of a home health agency would be most likely examined during an accreditation process? Select all that apply. So when an agency applies for accreditation, okay, it's a very lengthy process. Okay. The things that are reviewed, the three things that are reviewed are organizational structure, compliance with Medicare, and what are the outcomes? Okay, site, vis site visitors will accompany nurses or other providers on home visits to observe the steps they're doing. To maintain accreditation, agencies must follow the guidelines and undergo periodic reviews. Okay, so these are the three, this is what they look for. Okay, it's similar to going through a, a what is it, JC, what is it called in the hospitals? JCAH, accreditations in the hospitals. Every area has accreditation visits, whether it's a hospital, a home health agency, a hospice center, a rehab center, everybody has an accreditation process. Okay. Okay, let's uh, let's do a migrant uh, question. Migrant farm worker presents to the clinic and reports an acute onset of dizziness, intense thirst, vomiting, fatigue, headache, difficulty concentrating. Which of the following conditions would cause such symptoms? Okay, what what would you highlight? I would highlight a I would highlight who the population is. It's the migrant farm worker. So you have to think in migrant farm worker terms here, all right? They have all these symptoms. What do we know? What did you learn about migrant farm workers that is risky, very risky? What are they exposed to? Pesticides. Yeah, they're exposed to pesticides. And as you read about acute pesticide exposure and chronic pesticide exposure, these are all symptoms of acute pesticide exposure. I mean, the other answers don't make sense because, well, it could be, but we're looking at, I'm you will need to think in terms of a migrant farmer. So mild symptoms of pesticide or exposure include all of what's in the question. Okay, and then the rationale gives you severe poisoning symptoms. Okay. The nurse is implementing a tertiary prevention strategy related to pesticide exposure. Which of the following activities would the nurse complete? So what's tertiary? Let's review it. It's in the it's in your rationale. So if we were going to do a primary prevention with migrant workers, we'd teach them how to reduce their pesticide exposure. Right? Secondary screening. We would conduct screenings, maybe urine testing for pesticide exposure. And then tertiary, they have had a pesticide exposure, right? So we have to do, initiate some kind of a treatment. Maybe something for nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, skin irritation. All right, so the obvious answer for tertiary would be A. It says treat the client that has a pesticide exposure. So they have something. They've had the exposure. What would B be? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? Primary. Primary. We're teaching them how to recognize. Okay? It hasn't happened yet. What about C? What's C?
Primary. 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 What's D? Secondary. Yeah, we're observing them. We're kind of screening them, aren't we? We're observing them to see if they have safe handling, safe, safe, safe handling of pesticides. Questions on that? Number eight. So a teenage who a teenager who's just come in for her prenatal visit appears to be about six months pregnant. Which of the following best best describes why the teenage girl has waited so long to come in? A lot of information in that question. Okay, we know it's a teenager. Highlight that. Six months pregnant. Highlight that. She's pretty far along. The word best. Best. I know it's a select all the reply, but you're looking for the best answers. And the question is asking specifically, why has she waited so long to come in? Okay. So A, appropriate. She was afraid her parents would find out. B, appropriate. She kept hoping the pregnancy would go away. C, dreading the uh, GYN exam. Okay, D doesn't make sense. Well, D doesn't make sense in a, in the way that the question's being asked is why did she wait so long? D has nothing to do with that, as does E, all right? The question specifically says, why did she wait so long? So a lot of information in this question to have to pull out. Okay, so some teens de delay seeking pregnancy services because they fail to recognize the early signs, breast tenderness, maybe a late period. However, they're most likely suspected, right? However, they do still delay seeking care because they falsely hope the pregnancy will just go away. They also may delay seeking care to keep it a secret from the family who may be angry, disappointed, or force her into making decisions she doesn't want to make or because she doesn't want to have a GYN exam. Jump in if you have any questions. Okay, number nine, a client request help stop smoking. Which of the following methods would best would would be the best for the nurse to suggest to the client? Okay, so the important word in here is best. Looking for the best answer. This could be another question that's you have more than one answer that you say, oh, it could be A, B, or C, or A, B, or D but it's not a select all the ply. I have to go back and read the question and see, did they put a specific word in there that I didn't pick up on? That word would be best. Okay. B could be correct. C could be correct. D could, this would be, they could all be correct actually. So what's the best? Well, a combination of interventions beginning with changing the environment. We do know that the setting is the influence, okay, for physical, social, cultural environment where this where the smoking occurs, right? We know that social conditions influence the use of drugs. Fast pace of life, competition at school, the workplace, frightening pandemic, um, daily advertising pharma, of pharmaceutical of medications of alcohol tobacco okay so it would be a combination the best would be a combination of interventions beginning with changing the environment okay for some people many of life's opportunities may seem out of reach rather than seeking relief through medical care they use psycho they'll use drugs or alcohol to numb the pain or trying to escape away from something that feels hopeless or feels helpless. Okay. Question 10. Did you guys get this right? How'd you set it up? Um, want over supply times ML. I want to show you, this is the PowerPoint I'm going to share with you, but I want, this is um, Professor, 
professor, I can't think of his last name, Johnson, who's part of our team, put this together. This we're going to be reviewing next. This is how he set it up, which I thought was an excellent way to set it up. Right? So our question asked for 180, right? 180. So you have your IV solution, 125 per five, and then you have what you need. So our question was 180. So it was set up as 125 per five, which we know we have. I don't want to confuse anybody. But for so anybody that got it wrong, this is a pretty easy way to set it up. All right. So we have we know we have 125 per five. We want six, we need 160, but we don't, that's the that's the X, right? So he set it up 125 per five mils, 160. And that's the green is what we're looking for here. If you multiply the inner and outer numbers. Right, so the inner number is 160 times five, which he has here, which is 125. And then the outer numbers, we still have the Y, right? So if you multiply 160 times five, the inner numbers, you come up with 800. Right, we still have the 125 with the Y, 800 divided by 125, come, Oh, ours was 900 because we were looking for 180, right? So 900 divided by the 125 came out to 7.2. Okay. Make sense? Okay. So after reviewing the quiz, let me stop sharing here. After re reviewing the quiz and looking at the rationales, do you have a better understanding of why you got it right and why you got it wrong? Okay, so we're gonna do a, a review here. I wanna bring up this PowerPoint that Professor Johnson shared and let's talk about it. Okay, this is our, can you guys see this? Yes? I will send this to you, okay? So let's talk about this. Define rural health nursing. What are some of the pros and cons of rural health? How would the public health nurse address the issues? I wanna hear from you now. So define rural health. What, do you, what are you gonna see when you take care of a rural population? And guess what? You're the only nurse. You're the only nurse there. All right, you don't have a lot of doctors, you don't have pediatricians, you don't have OBGYNs, you're it. You might be the school nurse, the urgent care nurse, the immunization nurse, the ER nurse, the L&D nurse. And you really don't think about rural populations unless you either live in one or you have family and go visit. You don't really think about it. I live in a rural population at the moment. Um, I go back and forth between Denver and Wisconsin. I'm way up in Northwest Wisconsin. I am up in the boonies. I mean, I'm maybe an hour from the Canadian border. I am in a rural agricultural town um, on a lake and there is nothing. I have to drive half an hour to get anywhere, to get to a grocery store, um, I've got to know the public, I was telling my other group the other day, I've got to know the public health nurse up in this area. She covers four counties. Four counties. And her and I have got to know each other because I like to find out what her experiences are in rural health as a public health nurse. And amazingly, it's exactly what I teach you guys. So what are you going to see? What do you, what, what do you think? How do you think the rural population, what do you think they're, uh, what do you think they think about healthcare? Do they prioritize it? No. Why? There's not a lot of options for them to go to. Right. They feel good. Why well, go to a doctor? Right. Plus they might have to travel. Remember a lot of rural a lot of people in the rural populations don't have insurance or they're very underinsured. 
So they're not going to seek out their primary primary cares, right? A lot of populations in the in the rural areas uh, work in work maybe hour kind of like the migrants work hourly jobs, daily paying jobs. So they have to take a day off to go travel to the cities for a specialist. They lose a day of pay, right? Very limited resources in the rural community. You might have a nurse practitioner, a public health nurse. You might have a family doctor. As far as all the specialties, pediatricians and, and OBGYNs and neurologists and orthopedics, you got to travel. I'm in between Duluth and Eau Claire. So those are the two cities I'll be going to. Eat there uh, two hours away, both ways. Okay. Um, what are some pros though? What are some pros of rural health? Okay, you do get to know your patients, right? You do, because you're the only one there, right? You have autonomy. Okay. Um, yes, it's hard because you have to have all your tools in the toolbox. You could be caring for kids all the way to the elderly. One of the things that's pretty prevalent in rural communities is chronic illness. And that's because they don't prioritize their care. Right? Barriers. Barriers in rural care. What do you think they are? Access. Right? Access to health care. Um, whether it's lack of providers, lack of insurance, lack of facilities. The other thing that's a big barrier is transportation. Right? A lot of these people don't have personal cars to get around. And there's not public train, there's no buses or trains up here. Okay. Let's talk about what are some of the health concerns for women, children in rural areas, mental health care, at risk populations. You guys had a lot, there's a lot of, uh, there, there were several videos in your announcement. I don't know if you had a chance to watch them, but um, take a look at them. They're excellent resources. So let's think about kids. Children who work on farms and ranches are often exposed to a lot of different things. Children are very at risk in the migrant population on the farms, exposed to noise, dusts, hazards, accidents are very prevalent in rural migrant communities, whether it's tools, machinery, tractors, whatever, farming equipment, right? Kids that work on the farms usually uh, learn how to work by watching their parents, right? They may not have PBE where they're working, right? So there's an increase for injuries, both with kids and adults, okay? And think about the the question asked, what's the concerns for uh, women, children, mental health? There's no uh, specialist up here. So if you have, let's say you have a high-risk pregnancy, you're having to travel to get that high-risk care. It's not available in your migrant community, right? So that potentially has risks for poor pregnancy outcomes, right? Okay, we started talking about these. What are some other barriers? You guys tell me. The lack of privacy. Lack of privacy. There's no anonymity. Everybody knows everything. I have got to be friendly with the little lady, Summer, who works at the local post office, which is probably a 400 square foot building. She knows everything about everybody and their families and their extended families. Everything. If I want to, if I want to get the scoop, I go see Summer at the post office. She knows everything. There, is, you're absolutely right. There is no privacy. What else? What are the other barriers? I talked about transportation. The internet. Internet issues. Broad with broadband issues. They're really working on it, and I see as I'm driving up here. I see a lot of, they're laying lots of cable. They're trying to get, the, uh, they have government grants to try and get 
internet services all around here. So everybody has access. Because once you have access, good access to internet, you can, you won't, maybe you don't have to travel two hours down to the cities. Maybe you can do your telehealth visits, meet with your doctor online, right? We talked about outreach services. Uh, it's very limited. Um, unpredictable weather, travel conditions. You know, maybe if they don't have insurance, they can't pay for a visit out of pocket. Okay. Uh, language barrier. Let's talk about that. Language barriers. A lot of your migrant population is going to have a language barrier. That's a given. So let's say you're the only nurse up here and you have a big migrant population that doesn't speak English. What do you do? It's really hard. Let's say they, they come and seek services. They may, well, first of all, they may not be motivated to seek services because number one, they can't communicate what's going on. And they may not understand what they are diagnosed with or have. And they may not understand the, the follow-up plan. So language barriers can be a huge, huge issue. And then the other thing is culturally appropriate care. You may have a lot of migrants, a lot of people who live in the rural population who are from different cultures. And remember, you're the only one up there. You're the only one. So we have to do a really good job in being culturally knowledgeable about different cultures. You know, if you have a particular, let's say, Mexican culture that's prevalent working on the farms, <clears throat> best you know what migrant, <clears throat> what the culture is <clears throat> with regards to how they feel about working, how they feel oh, their culture, what are their attitudes, what are their beliefs, what are their practices. Okay, we start talking about this migrant workers, where are they exposed to? And again, you're going to receive this PowerPoint. Uh, how would you do prevention levels? Well, how do you do prevention levels? That's, that was one of your quiz questions. You teach them how, how to, you teach them the signs and symptoms of pesticide exposures. Okay. What are the, okay, let's jump to homelessness. What are the effects of homelessness on health? What do you think? What is homelessness? If you're homeless, are you, is the only definition of homeless living on the street? What did you learn about homelessness? Who can be homeless? Anyone. Anyone. You could be, well, I saw this during the pandemic in the schools. Many people had to sell their homes. They lost jobs. They had to move in with family. Let's say you move in with a family, but you don't have a place to go that's a permanent address. That's considered homeless. Okay, it's a person who lacks fixed, regular, adequate residence. One of the things that goes hand in hand with homelessness is poverty. Okay, what do we think the effects? Well, let's go back to the original question. What are the effects of homelessness on health? Poor health? How do you think the homeless look at their health? Is their primary health, their prevention health a priority? They have clinics they can walk to and go down the street and go to their primary care visit? No. Their health is going to be poorer. They will be, they, well, homeless people tend to finally seek care when they get desperate and they go to the emergency rooms. You're not going to see them in the primary care clinics. Okay. Let's talk about poverty here. Poverty, poverty, homelessness affect health and well being. Now we know homelessness does lots of risks with the homelessness with health. A lot of um, back to homeless again, chronic conditions. 
skin conditions, maybe from heat, cold exposure, mental health, substance abuse, violence, domestic violence, abuse. Okay? Poverty. Poverty directly affects the health and well being. Okay? How does poverty affect health? Higher rates of chronic illness, higher morbidity and mortality, definitely a shorter life expectancy. Okay? Whoops. How else is poverty going to affect your health? What do you think? Come on, you guys are quiet. I don't want to like listen your, to myself. Your mental, Go like ahead. Your mental status? Affect mental status? Yeah, because well, like... Affect your mental like, health, like, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your Is that what you mean? Yeah, your mental health, sorry. Yeah, yeah, your mental health. I mean, you live in... A, think about it. Think about an individual. Remember, our community... When we're working in the community, we could be working with an individual, a family, or a subset of the community. Think about an individual who lives in poverty, a family who lives in poverty. You can or the have, community who lives in poverty. What is that going to affect? Everything. You get more chronic illnesses. Yeah. Chronic illnesses, you may have less access to nutrition, nutritional resources. Less access to healthcare, less access to. Um, They're also more like prone to get infections because they don't have like cleanliness and stuff. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think about if you live in a community that is a high rate of poverty. Yeah, maybe there's crowded living conditions. Tuberculosis. That's high cool. risk of TB. High risk of obesity. High risk of violence. High risk of abuse. Okay, what's the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? Here's the way I remember it. Go ahead, you guys tell me. I'll Medicare is for 65 and up, and then Medicaid is for like people who don't have that much like um money or need as much money. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So Ivana just gave you the definition. You do need to know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. All right, they're both federal programs. Like Ivana said, 65 and older. And then Medicaid is needs-based. Okay. There's a lot of slides in this, so I'm kind of skipping through to touch on our concepts. Parish nurse. I like this one. All right, so what are some of the qualities a parish nurse needs to have in order to care for their community? Think med surge, mental health, spirituality, define parish nursing. We've kind of already done that with the quiz question, but parish nurse could be taking care of anybody, could be taking care of clients that need wound care, clients that need IV therapy. Um, they're just not going to the visit. They're just not going to offer the spiritual side. They're actually going to probably do some illness care. I don't know, IVs, wounds, medication checks. And when they're there, they add the uh, spiritual side to it, right? So they're looking at the whole person, all right? So you do have to have your bed search skills. You do have to have your mental, mental health skills, a focus on spirituality. We, talk, we already talked about what parish nursing is. Ethical issues for parish nurses. Think about think about end of life issues and the way parish nurses deal with that when they're trying to bring the spirituality into it. Physicians should accommodate, they should accommodate their religious and spiritual beliefs, understanding, have an understanding of suffering, even when they disagree. Right, as long as they uphold their commitment to health, 
right? Physicians and chaplains who promote patients' spiritual well-being should respectfully challenge patients when necessary. And that's the whole ethics piece of faith-based nursing. A lot of ethical issues can come up, right? Home health, and we talked about this pretty extensively when we reviewed that quiz question, how, how are home health and hospice similar? How are they different? No, we talked about palliative versus home health. Okay, so let's look at this. All right. There are notes, I'm not gonna go through this one, but there are notes at the bottom of all of these um, slides for you to read through. But let's just talk, I'm not gonna go through all these notes. That's a lot of reading. How are, How's home health and hospice similar? How are they different? How are they similar? Where are we providing the care? At home. Yeah. Like, mm, at home. Know. How are they different? Because one necessarily doesn't have to be like in the end of life stage. And then exactly. hospice is kind of like end of life. Exactly. 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 Anybody want to add to what Ivana said? It's exactly right. I want to do the case study. So I'm going to critical thinking. Okay. This is. Okay. Evidence-based practice. What's evidence-based practice? It's done by studies. So they got, it's like they've done trials to right. see if it's right or wrong. Okay. But what is evidence-based practice? Because our nursing profession should be practicing, ev our practice should be based on evidence-based practice. Um, using the most up-to-date information. Exactly. Casey, and did you say that? Yes. I can't see your face. I can only see your forehead. I'm sorry. Excellent. That's exactly what it is. Say that again. Using. Say that again, Casey. And. Using the most up-to-date information for practice. Yep. That's exactly right. Whether it, co it comes from our research journals, from clinical trials, from research Whatever whatever area of nursing you're working in, we should all be using evidence-based practice, right? So maybe two years ago, you work on a stroke unit. Two years ago, the patients were staying for two weeks. Maybe now they're st they maybe now they're staying a week. That decrease in week was probably based on evidence-based practice. How could we do things better? more efficiently, maybe co more cost-effective, but still maintaining um, the best outcome for the client. Right? Does that make sense? Does anybody work with anybody that has ever said, ah, we've been doing it like this for 30 years, so we don't need to change anything? Does anybody work with anybody like that? I do. Right? And you try and explain, well, there are better ways to do things now. Whether it's a better medication or a better way to get the patient out of bed or a better way or a sooner, let's say you have a patient with cardiac surgery. Well, now you try and get them out of bed that first evening, right? At least sit in the chair. Well, that was never like that before. But you have that employee that says, oh, you know, I'm just not comfortable doing that. That was a, it's hard. Changing practices, changing, changing up the way you do things can be hard. But evidence-based practice should be the primary focus. Always updating and using the best available. I mean, look at the beginning of the pandemic, right? Of COVID. We didn't have a clue what we were doing, right? But as time went on, we learned to care for people more efficiently, right? We 
maybe decrease the number of hospitalizations, saying we could take care of a patient better at home. I can speak for the schools. I, I was in the schools the full two years of the pandemic. At the very beginning, we were clueless. But then we started, we had research, we had data, we had experience. We could manage classrooms better, manage school buildings better. Okay. Ethics. Ethical issues can occur in any situation. We have ethical issues that come up in our life every single day. They're not just work related. We have ethical issues that come up within our families. We have ethical issues that come up within our relationships, in our workplace, in the school environment. Right? Ethics is what's right. Right? Righteousness. What is the right thing to do? Ethical issues can occur in any situation where moral questions arise. Is it right or is it wrong? And ethics takes us through our whole life and all of our different facets of life. Personal, professional, okay? But in nursing, what do we do that's right that will benefit the care of the patients? What is morally right? Ethics or morals? Resiliency, vulnerability. We've talked about vulnerability. Remember, with vulnerability, comes decreased, you probably have a absence or decrease in resiliency, right? One of, at the current, in the current situation, one of the things that as community nurses, as nurses in general, when we're working with vulnerable populations, one of the things we try and do is build resiliency, right? Because we want to lift them out of their vulnerable situation, right? So resiliency is an important word in our community nursing practice. We're always trying to build resiliency. The more we can build resiliency, the better the situations can be for the family or the individual to lift themselves up. Okay. That was our math question. Okay. So, is that a good overview of all the stuff we're supposed to cover this today? Yes. You have Thank a better you. understanding of everything? There's a lot of vulnerable a lot of vulnerable populations in our community. A lot. And if you're working in the community as a community nurse, public health nurse, you're going to be working with vulnerable populations all the time. If you're working in rural health, you're going to be working with vulnerable populations all the time. That's part of what goes along with public health, vulnerable populations. It's great if you, if you are in a position in the public health department to be community oriented, do community oriented nursing, taking a look at the whole community. Wow, what's the health, what's the current health status of the community? What do they need? What are their need? Uh, what do they need? What health, health education do they need? What's the overall assessment of the community? That's great. That's great. But most of the time we're, we're in community-based nursing, right? Where we're already taking care of the vulnerable. And we just went through lots of vulnerable populations and lots of risks that these people have, okay? All right, I'm gonna break you guys out into three groups real quick. Some you guys pull up on your computer or somebody pull up, pull up on your computer that case study. I sent it in the announcement. Room one is going to answer question one. Room two is going to answer question two. Room three is going to answer question three. And it's a migrant slash rural case study. I'm just going to be in a room for five minutes. And then you guys talk about it as a group, come up with your answer, and then we'll come back and we'll go through the answers and then we're done. How's that sound? All right. So here you go. So I just need you to dialogue with each other for a bit. I actually like this case study. This is a good case study. Okay. All right, 
I'll see you at five. I'll check in with you guys, but every, pull that case study up. Okay. Christina, you're going to join your group. Hello. It's awful quiet in here. Did you already come yeah. up with your answer? No. Probably. I'm trying to well, you out. better read quick because we're coming out in a couple couple of minutes. Just answer question one. Um, I think it's C. Yeah, it was between C or or A. It says, oh. I'm just checking. You guys okay? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're coming back in a minute. Okay. 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 Um. It's awful quiet in here. Did you guys figure out your answer? Yeah, I think we're all deciding on C, D, and E. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're all coming back now. Thank you. Did you like that case study? That's a pretty good take. I think it applies to what we're what we've been talking about, right? right? Remember, remember, the whole goal of Next Gen is to apply knowledge to application, right? That's what it's all about. So with your NCLEX, with your CJ Sims, you can see their clinical, not so much NCLEX, but CJ Sims, clinical, applying knowledge to cl clinical, right? That's what this is all about. All right, I'm going to pull this up and I will actually send you guys this as well. This is the instructor case study. So it gives you the answer and it gives you the rationale. All right, so I'm gonna send you this to you as well so you can read through it, okay? So we went through the case study. Um, what, um, room one, what's the answer number one without looking at this? Did you we come up with C? 
C, yes, we decided we did. on C. Great. Is and we it? talked about that, right? The question is asking specifically about the actual nurse, right? Not a client, but the nurse. What are the challenges, right? We talked about this. Isolation, limited opportunities. There's nobody around to talk to. You know, your second opinion may be a call down to the cities, right? Everybody knows everybody. Lack of anonymity, heavy workloads, needing to know all your clinical areas, because you could be taking care of anything, right? But on the flip side, I can tell you rural nurses value their relationship with their community, okay? And I'm not going through the whole rationales for these, just a snippet of it. You'll be able to read these when you get it. All right, group two, what'd you come up with? What's the right answer? We picked D and our reasoning behind it was because there might be like a language barrier. So, exactly. um, you know, we didn't like, that's what we said. So there might've been like, um, exactly. you know, it's just easier to nod. Exactly. Exactly. And that's part, Ivana, of what we talked about of knowing cultures, right? So if you're work working in a rural uh, migrant community and you know that there are specific cultures, you best to learn about those cultures, right? That's your job. Great. And then uh, C, what did you come up with? Or right, group three, did you come up with C, D, and E? Yes, C, D, and E. C, D, and E, right. Yeah. Right, so, so yeah. Working in the field 12, chose, 13 hours a day is multiple issues. Go ahead, Mariana, go ahead. So we chose um skin cancer because obviously he's out in a field for all those hours. Mm -hmm. So the sun and then... The chronic neck, neck and back pain because he's moving and packing yep. crates. So perfect he's training his body, and then um the eye problems related to dust and chemicals because on a field like everything's just blowing in your face. Fantastic, and the rationale states all that, and I'm going to send that to you. So, a couple things I'm going to send to you. I'm going to send you that uh PowerPoint with review of weeks three and four. I'm going to send you the my version of the case study that has the answers and the question and the rationales, right? For you to go through. Okay. And so then you will have everything for this week. Okay. Um, I feel bad I didn't send the rest of the PowerPoint before, but I, I didn't really know I had access to it. So until a couple of days ago. Okay, so hopefully this class has been helpful. We did cover a lot. I get that. But you guys are doing great. You guys are doing great so far. So far, you're doing great. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep being engaged. Keep participating. Pay attention. And you will sail through this class. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'm, too, uh, I'm doing better today. I'm only two minutes over. Because remember, we stopped 10 minutes early because I don't give you a break. Or we all decided we weren't. So I'm only two minutes over. So if anybody has any questions that will benefit the whole group, please ask now. If you have particular questions that can wait, um, you just stay on after and I will answer them. All right. So does anybody have any questions that will benefit the group? Fantastic. Then you are free to go. I hope you guys have a good rest of the week and we'll see you next week.